Well, I'm excited to share with you guys uh, an interview today with Dayton Moore, the general manager of the Kansas City Royals. And before we jump into it, I want to give a few stats. First of all, Dayton was born in Wichita. He grew up as a Royals fan. In 2005, he had worked through a career to become the assistant to the general manager, Hall of Famer John Scherholz of the Atlanta Braves. And then in 2006, he comes to the Kansas City Royals. And of course, we know that it has been an extraordinary uh, career here. Uh, we, in 2014, go to the World Series, end up going seven games with the San Francisco Giants and are 90 feet away from a win. And then we flip it, go back in 2015 and 2015, win the World Series, five games, New York Mets. Today, uh, we see Dayton as a guy who has tremendous awards and recognition. Uh, in, since 2006, 17 Rawlings Gold Love, Glove Awards, 28 All-Star selections, a Cy Young Award winner, um, the uh, 21 All-Star selections since 2013 are tied with the most in the American League and third most of the majors. When I think about Dayton, I think about a man who has been known for his faith. He's outspoken. He and his wife, Mary Ann, are involved in multiple uh, nonprofits helping our community. Uh, Dayton has been named the Kansas Baseball Hall of Fame. He's He's in it. He's the Kansan of the year in 2014, and he was the executive of the year by MLB in 2014 and 2015. He's been married for 26 years to Marianne. He's got three kids, two daughters, Ashley, who's 23, Avery, who's 20, and Robert, who's 17. So we welcome today our friend and the leader of the Royals tribe, uh, Dayton Moore. Dayton, I want to say thank you for being a part of this whole interview. What a, well, what a blessing. I love Appreciate it, man. You thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, big, uh, big, big beginning. It's such an honor for me. I want to congratulate you on the 2015 World Series championship. I just want to know, what did that championship mean to you? What did it mean to you? You know, I, I get asked that question a lot, and um, I start asking myself that question almost uh, on, the, on from the bus uh, back to the hotel that night. And... Um, you know, it's, it's tough to put into words uh, when you work uh, so diligently and, and uh, for something and you see the celebration of your players and your staff and your community and all your fans. I mean, that's, that's great. That's, that's really rewarding. And, and, uh, but, you know, just reflecting a couple days later, uh, one of the things that just really hit me and uh, it was really powerful. Uh, and it was simply this. It was, you know what, the, the neat thing about what we were able to accomplish is uh, we, we convinced a group of people to come to Kansas City to work for the Royals at a point in time when uh, the Royals weren't a popular place to work. They were young, they had young families, and through all of this journey, uh, all of our families stayed together. The kids uh, were relatively thriving, uh, uh, Families were intact, marriages stayed strong. Not to say that they didn't have struggles, not to say that some of our, 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 our leaders and coaches didn't seek uh, marriage counseling along the way uh, because there were challenges, but that was the thing that was most rewarding. But you know what? Our family stayed together in, a, in an industry that requires you know, so much energy, so much, uh, so, such a strong work ethic. You're under the microscope, you're dealing with criticism, uh, and uh, you're at a point in time in your life where professionally you got to have the throttle down and personally you got to have the throttle down because you've got a young family that you're trying to raise. And so re reflecting on that a couple of days later, that's what hit me. The Holy Spirit kind of revealed that to me. And I'm like, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for that. That's amazing. You know, in 2014, when we made it to the World Series, so we just beat Baltimore and we make it to the World Series, I'm sitting in my office actually prepping for a Sunday message. And the emotion, we just won. I mean, we just won. And the emotion was so overwhelming for me, I, I cried. I was crying to get yeah. into the World Series in 2014. And you know the reason I was crying is largely because of you. And you probably don't hear this kind of thing very often. But the reason 
that you touched me is because of watching you, watching you be faithful, be diligent. And of course, as a leader, uh, you're going to be critiqued. You can't be in leadership without being critiqued. And sometimes people are raging in their critiques. They're, they're uh, thoughtless. They don't necessarily. And so as a pastor, I've, I felt that over my career at times. And so for you to win yeah. made me feel like I won. It's, it made me feel like, yeah. um, you know what? The grind sometimes, the impossibilities, the question marks, because I deal with those, and I'm sure you dealt with those from 2006 up. You had the vision, gave you boldness, but then you were tracked back with these narratives of, really, can you? Do you have enough? So for you, let's talk a, bit, a little bit about those you know, dark years that felt like everything was being critiqued. You were being judged and sometimes maybe self-doubt entered in. How do you contrast that to the big win? Well, for, first, let me say this. If there's, if there's anything good in me, it comes from God, Definitely. period. And, um, you know, I just I'm so thankful that we serve a God that gives us multiple chances, because most days, truthfully, when I put my head on the pillow at night, uh, I, I can reflect back on some ways that I, I didn't do, I didn't lead very well. I, I don't feel worthy to lead some days and, and a lot of days I simply do not want to lead. Um, and, and so but so I appreciate you, you saying that um, you, you can't do it without good people around you. Right. People that that are encouraging, people that are supportive. The only reason I get to sit here today in my 13th year of being a general manager is, I believe, is because I've allowed people to speak truth into my life. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've had some discernment along the way. God's given me discernment of who's earned the right to speak into my life and listen to them. Uh, I've had great spiritual mentors. You know, you ask about the criticism piece. Um, one of my spiritual mentors, a gentleman by the name of Tim Cash, who was our baseball chapel leader with the Atlanta Braves, always talked to me about the importance of understanding uh, that people are looking at you two ways, with a critical eye or a critical spirit. And thank God for those people that are looking at you with a critical eye. They can help shape you and mold you, like wow. I, I mentioned. But those that are looking at you with a critical spirit, there's probably nothing that you can do to please them anyway, right? And so just, just give it away. And then I'm reminded constantly is that, you know, Jesus walked with the disciples for three and a half years. Yeah. And he, he broke bread with them. They saw all the miracles. They could touch him. And they still betrayed him. And, wow. and, 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 and what did he do? He forgave them. Yes. And so, um, you know, I, I look at it as a tremendous blessing to do what I've been doing since I was a little boy. Uh, Patrick, I can't recall a day in my life where I haven't dreamt or thought about this game of baseball. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's been my, it, my God along the way, too, and I've yep. had to struggle with that. Yep. It's, it's been too important to me. Uh, thankfully, I have a, a wife who has pointed that out to me along the way. Uh, and so, um, but I appreciate you sharing what this, uh, the, the World Series, what it meant to you. And, and, and that's the cool thing about it. I mean, we get a chance to listen to people, uh, all of our fans and write letters. And, 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 you know, they were with their, their sick mother, their sick father, or it mm. reunited a father and a son together that had been distant for many years. I mean, we get those letters and, and that's what it's all about. You understand right away that what you do is much, much bigger than baseball. Yes, yes, and a reflection of God's heart to encourage everybody that you can win too, that God's grace is big enough for all of us. Right. Well, let's go back to your childhood. Where did you come into this love for baseball, and particularly, how did you become a Royals fan from, from just a little boy? Well, I, I was born in Wichita, as you mentioned, uh, but we, we moved early on in our lives uh, as my father uh, attempted to, to do better for us, we bounced around a little bit. It was all good. He, he worked in the airline industry um, and he was an airline mechanic. But every, every uh, August, we would spend two to three weeks in a little town in western Kansas by the name of Coldwater. My grandmother was a huge Kansas City Royals fan. My mother was a big baseball fan. And of course, the Royals were an easy team to root for, you know, back in the 70s and in the, the early 80s because they were the model organization in baseball. So that was primarily where my love for, for baseball uh, became is just the, the passion of, of my mother and my grandmother and, and, and for the game and, and the Kansas City Royals. In reading your book, your book on more than a game, you talk about how you would, even uh, in your 
coaching career. You would go back and read box scores with grandma. Yeah. That has to be a special deal in its yeah. own right. That's incredible. Yeah. I don't know too many people whose grandma sat down and read box scores <laughs> with their, uh, their grandson. Um, you, uh, you played baseball, and as you said, you have never had a day in your life that you hadn't thought about baseball. Um, but in that, you, you ultimately were dreaming of being a coach. How did you get into the executive offices? What, what brought you to be a GM? You know, I, most of the, it goes back to decisions that we've made, what we felt was best for our family, right? So uh, my father always told me, work every job you have like it's the last one you'll ever have. Okay, so it's always been my mindset uh, in everything that we've done. And so when I began uh, as a college coach, uh, I had a couple opportunities to get into scouting with a, with a couple of organizations. I, I immediately said, no, I'm not interested. I'm focused on, on, on coaching. Then the Atlanta Braves called. They offered me the same position. I decided to go meet with them in Atlanta. And uh, I decided I was going to take that job for four years and get back into uh, college coaching. So I went. I started scouting. After two years, the Braves called and they said, look, we want you to come down to Atlanta and be the assistant director of scouting. I said, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm focused on what I'm doing in scouting. Plus, I knew in my heart I wanted to get back into college coaching. Um, but Marianne and I had made an advanced decision uh, when we got married that when we had children, she was going to uh, stay home with our kids. Uh, now, Marianne was the breadwinner. I mean, she was she was making forty thousand dollars at the time in in 1996 uh, with sales commission for a company called Spot Image. They sold satellite imagery. We were living in northern Virginia, the Washington, D.C. area. If you know anything about that area, you can't survive without two incomes. Right. And so um, I was making twenty six thousand dollars as an area scout. Uh, we decided that, you know what, if we were going to fulfill what our mission was, uh, in raising our children, we were going to have to make that move, even though it was not what I wanted to do professionally. And so we, we, we sold our house. We, we actually uh, paid $4,000 to get out of the house. Mm. Uh, it was our first home. We bought a little townhouse uh, just right uh, east of Dulles Airport. Mm. And uh, we moved to Atlanta. Atlanta was affordable at the time. Uh, I, I, had a, I got a raise. I was making uh, $32,000, but we could live in yeah on one income during that period of time. So that's how the journey began into uh, this line of, of work in baseball. That's incredible. I love how you stayed with your passion and your passion, your gifts, your, even your surrender to, to Jesus about it has made room for you that might have surprised you, but really took you places. It did. It's, it's amazing. It did. Well, let's talk a minute about uh, professional athletes. What do you think is the most difficult part about being a professional athlete because you're not just a GM. Anybody who knows you, reads about you, knows that you kind of take a, a fatherly role in their lives. You care about them um, and you see all of the dangers that are around them. What do you think is the most difficult part about being a professional athlete? Well, there's, there's a lot of things that, that uh, lead to that challenge. I mean, this, this field out here, this arena that uh, our players uh, perform in, it's a breeding ground for insecurity, right? Players have the freedom and the choices of manhood, and they have the responsibility of boys. It's not their fault. They, they grow up um, with so, so competitive, they got to be the best of the best. They get stuck in that world of comparison. Uh, where it's robbing them of their joy, it's robbing them of their peace, it's robbing them of their harmony and their contentment uh, for life, everything that you need to be successful. But they're, they're, uh, they're a part of that world. And they, and, and they have to constantly self-evaluate and, and compare uh, to how they stack up to others. And so you, you have to know that going into it. And at the end of the day, Patrick, the most important thing that we can do is just continue to believe in them and encourage them. And, and not judge them when they fail. And, and so people ask me all the time, why are players so inconsistent with, with baseball chapel? Yeah. Right? yeah. And a lot of it is because when they do mess up, they stay wounded, they don't feel the grace, uh, they don't feel the love, they don't feel that somebody's continuing to pursue them. And so what we've tried to do is just say, look, it, it's, it's okay, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah, you're, you're a new Christian. Uh, you, you've given your life to Christ, but guess what? 
Now it's going to be even harder. Yeah. But the great thing is now that you have that thing called grace yes. that, that we have in, in, in Jesus. Yes. And that's going to allow you to not stay wounded in life and continue to put your best foot forward. And you've got a group of people now around you that understand that. Yes. Care about you. And we're not judging you. And so that's the thing that we've always tried to do. We're, we're not judging you where you came from or what you've done. We're just going to love you. And we're just going to continue to, to move forward each and every day with expectations that it, it's going to get better in life. Absolutely. We like to say that God loves you, He likes you, and He's in a good mood to you. Because sometimes, don't we, as, as sons and, and daughters of God, think that I'm the child that God loves because he has to, but he doesn't really like me. I kind of irritate him. I'm the one that agitates God. But when you think of God biblically, he's a God who is in a good mood to you. And that good mood, it's the goodness of God that leads our heart to turn to him. Right. And so I, I think it's incredible that you have taken that posture as an influencer in their lives. Well, let's talk just for a minute about uh, an executive. What's the hardest and most difficult thing you do uh, being a, a general manager? I mean, you're at, the, you're at the helm of this massive ship that is the Kansas City Royals. Yeah. You know, I, it's, that, that's a great question. Um, I don't view my job as work. Uh, I certainly, I love what, what we do here. Um, my biggest challenge, Patrick, is really just being being positive every single day uh, because you know that um, the people are watching they expect you to either say something or do something uh, especially if the team's going through struggles and, and we're definitely going through like a, a rebuild right yep. now, um, with our team and so it, it's it's sometimes it's hard to stay positive because you know I'm I'm feeling it. I've got a boss and he wants results Yes. He wants answers. Um, but I, I've found that uh, the most important thing I've got to identify with each and every day is, uh, first of all, I, I have to, I, I want to represent Jesus, right? I, I want to just continue to pursue him each and every day and give him all my troubles, knowing that he's handling all my problems. Uh, I've, I've got to give that away each and every day. I've got to forgive on a daily basis. That's renewing me. When I find myself feeling burnt out and discouraged, usually I can trace it back to the forgiveness piece. There's a relationship in my life that I need to, to mend, something I just need to give away. I under, need to understand that my, the most important team I have is at home and, uh, and, and, and being a husband and, and being a father, the thing that I can do for my children more than anything else is, is work really, really hard to keep my marriage strong and serve my wife and love her the way Christ loved the church, uh, sacrifice for her. Uh, you know, I, I've always wanted to do well for her. I've always wanted to excel at my job uh, more for her than me. I w I've wanted to make her proud. And uh, that, that's been important to me. Uh, that, I love that. Even in the pre-interview, just conversations we were having, you said that you went with a, for a walk last night, and you guys are just talking through life and connecting. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure nobody knows. I, I have no idea uh, the extremities of your schedule. Uh, but I can imagine that when you know the season's on, you are you're just from um, early morning to late nights, and yet you fight for your marriage. Can you just for a minute shift gears? Let's talk about home. Let's talk about marriage and your marriage. What's what would you say is the most difficult thing about marriage? Just about trying to navigate. You've been married twenty six years, mm -hmm. so there's a there's a lot of grace there. There's a, there's a victory. We need to we need to say thank you, Lord. Twenty six years and you still respect each other and you still love each other. So talk about that. What's the most difficult there? The hardest thing is is putting her first. Yeah, yeah. That's the hardest thing, it, and it's it's not being consumed with self is probably what I should have said. Yeah. Not knowing that, understanding that my family, it is it is at its highest level of dysfunction, when I'm consumed with me. Yeah, yeah. When it's when it's what I want to do, or I think it needs to be my way that's when my family is at its highest level of dysfunction. Amazing. And, uh, but, but, but look, the one thing I've learned really over the last 10 years or so, I mean, I, the greatest part of my day is being able to do something special for her. 
I mean, it, it really is amazing that, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, I, I want her, I, I want her to be happy. I want her to, to be, uh, do her own thing. Um, you know, she's, she's been a great encourager to me along the way. Uh, I, as I reflect back on that, I mean, it's just, uh, it's been amazing to have her support without it. I certainly couldn't do what I, what I want to do. And, and, uh, you know, any, any success that, that we've had together, we don't have it all figured out. Right. And if it was left up to me, um, you know, I, it probably wouldn't work out too well. Right. Right. Well, in your book, you talk about how, uh, baseball was first and it took a little bit to cut you away from baseball being first to actually even engage, uh, being married. And you talked about it. It was a real conversation. How did you shift that? How did you, how did you get there? Well, it was interesting. I mean, we, we were, uh, I was actually doing international work for the Braves at the time. And uh, we were on, a, 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 again, a walk together. And, uh, you know, Mary Ann hardly ever gets frustrated. She's very stable emotionally. And uh, she just shared with me during that walk that it's, baseball is like a cult. And she said, you're just so consumed with it. It's all you talk about is baseball. And then you're, everything you do, your schedule, everything that you do is consumed with baseball. If we want to take a family trip, it's always about baseball. When we decided to have our kids, it was around the baseball schedule. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, it, it hit me pretty good, right? And so I, I'm desiring to, to be a husband and to be a father. That's my most important team. That's ultimately going to be your legacy uh, on this earth and, you know, and along with your faith and your love yes. for Jesus. And, yes. um, you know, obviously I, I was failing and for my wife, for Marianne to hit me with that, that had to be something that, you know, she was, she had thought about and, and prayed about herself. And so that kind of stopped me in my tracks a little bit and made me know that I, that I need to do better. My father died at a young age. In fact, he died actually, as we do this interview, he died 28 years ago today. Today. Uh, Today. 91 May 14th Incredible. and so my father died young um, and I, I knew at that point in time that you know what I, I needed to do better and and my father was it was a workaholic he was consumed with his job I was going down the same trail uh, that was the example that I had uh, th there's worse examples I, I get it right. but um, it, it, it was still consuming sure. me and so I needed to change. And so through prayer, through other people praying for me, sharing that with, uh, with my pastor and, and my small group wow. and being transparent about that, guys, I, I've got to do better. I, I don't want to take my last breath wishing I, I would have done better and missing out on certain things. And so even in, our, even in our leadership style uh, going forward, and I've been blessed to lead departments since I was 27 years old, we, we've always said, look, we don't miss birthdays, we don't miss anniversaries, we don't miss special occasions. Uh, you need to understand your team is at home. Uh, and we, we have uh, enough quality people around us where we can cover. Uh, just the other day, uh, Scott Sharp, our, who's uh, our VP and assistant GM for baseball ops, he, he came to me and he said, uh, uh, look, is it okay if I miss this game? My two kids are playing. Well, he knew what the answer was going to be before he asked it. But I, I appreciate the respect that he had for the position and the integrity of what we're supposed to do here. Yeah. But we, we encourage our people if you, to, to, to not miss those activities. That's amazing. Children, so. That's amazing. Well, before, I can't just blow by that uh, about your dad. So when, you, when you're sitting here right now with me talking about Father's Day coming up, right? how are you experiencing the idea that your dad passed away today, yeah. 28 years? How are you processing that? Well, my, my father was, was my hero um, for a lot of reasons. He, uh, his father died early on in his life uh, in World War II. Uh, he was born in a little town called Idame, West Virginia. Um, and his mother, and I, I, I never really knew the, the true story. Some people said he spent four years in an orphanage. Some people said he spent months in an orphanage. He never really talked uh, about it. My mother never really talked about the details of that. Um, but um, several years later, <clears throat> he, uh, they reconnected with family in Andover, Kansas, okay? And so his mother eventually remarried. 
and uh, his stepfather was extremely abusive to him. Uh, and, and I heard a lot of the stories, but one of the things that really struck me uh, really hard and in a very good way, uh, it's been very memorable. I remember knowing those stories and later visiting uh, my father's uh, parents. Uh, my father was extremely respectful to his stepfather, treated him with great respect. And that, that always uh, uh, put an imprint on my mind, the importance of, of respecting your father, regardless of what he's done, regardless of how he's treated you. You don't have to, you don't have to like it, um, but you should treat him with respect in class, and, and my father always did that, and, uh, and, and nobody could or would have probably uh, said anything different if he did not, if he, if he chose to not treat him with respect. And, 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 and so what, what does that remind me of? Well, it reminds me of the forgiveness piece. Yes. It reminds me yes. of, of um, why you should forgive daily when people you know, treat you poorly. Um, don't give it away. Let revenge die. Wow. Let it go. Wow. And so that's that's what it's meant to me in my life. And so I'll often think about that is, you know, let it go. That's, a, it that's an amazing gift yeah. that, he, that he gave you. Well, our heart, my heart is with you right now, uh, just breathing in the reality of today is probably a very memorable mm -hmm. day uh, for you. Yeah. And thank you for sharing with us in this unique opportunity. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the marriage. Tell us something. What's your favorite thing about being married? <laughs> well, it's uh, just just being able to just to share, you know, intimate thoughts um, uh, and and to dream together about what we want to do in our future. I mean, our kids are at an age now where we're going to be empty nesters soon, and we're really looking forward to that phase of our life. Uh, my my wife likes to. Um, you know, to decorate things and, and uh, you know, how to renovate things. And uh, so we, we talk a lot about those types of, of uh, I guess, plans. You bet. Um, she's, she doesn't love to travel. I like to travel. Yeah. So there's, there's going to be some give and take. Right yeah, sure. There going forward. But, um, you know, that, but that's, that's probably the, the best thing. And, and, and of course, um, you know, uh, spending time in prayer together is mm. really a, a, a special time when I get to hear her heart mm. uh, and she gets to hear mine. And the, so those are those are special times. That's amazing. Well, you and Marianne have three kids, Ashley, who's 23, Avery, who's 20 and Robert, who's 17. Um, what would you say the most difficult thing is about being a dad to parent throughout their young years all the way up? Well, it's, it's all especially challenging. Uh, m most days, uh, if I'm completely transparent and honest, I, I feel like I'm not a very good father. I feel like I can do much, much better. Uh, again, seeking counsel from, from people like you and, and others, they remind me that Satan's a liar. Yes. Um, but oftentimes I feel very inadequate uh, I feel like I say the wrong things, or maybe I say the right things, but at the wrong time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's, that's a, a, a challenge uh, of mine. But I found that the best thing that I can do with our kids is, is pray with them. Yeah. That's the best thing I can do. Wow. And, and be very transparent when I make mistakes. And oftentimes, my son and I have knelt together, our daughters and I have knelt together, and I have admitted to God where I've blown it. And I've made mistakes and God, I need help with the proper way to communicate and discipline. Uh, I need guidance there. Uh, I just want to be the father and the husband that you want me to be God. And so th those are some of the things that, that we've done together. But I've, I've never there, there's nothing that that our especially our older daughter, there's there's nothing that uh, that I haven't failed at in my life that I haven't shared with her. She wow. knows my failures, right? Wow. I want her to know. Yeah. Because the only thing, Patrick, the only thing I really have to offer is my mistakes in life. Yeah. I mean, as a leader, that's really the only thing I, I can truly offer. Just, just complete transparency. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't deserve my wife. Um, I had uh, inappropriate relationships um, before 
I met Marianne. I don't deserve her. I know that. It's the grace of God. Therefore, I don't deserve my children. They belong to God anyway. Uh, and so I realize I don't deserve anything. And so I just want to try to be a, a, a character in their stories going forward where I can just kind of, uh, you know, I, look, at the end of the day, I just want my kids to come home for Thanksgiving and Christmas, right? I just want to have that relationship with them. <laughs> right, and right. Go forward. Well, I think it's a narrative that often happens inside of parents, and specifically we're talking about dads, where we don't feel like that we are enough, we're worthy, or we're valuable. Um, we see our shortcomings and wonder if we damaged our kids. Mm -hmm. And yet, in fact, uh, it is the, the gift of fatherhood and the grace that is in that. And to, ultimately, it's love, it's transparency, it's vulnerability, um, and letting them see that you're not hiding, you're not being inauthentic. So I really, really appreciate that somebody of your, you know, what we perceive is your caliber of a leader that you have experienced the same narrative. You know, one of the questions I have for you is, you're well known for what's called honesty. That's the word people use, that you are honest. And in the business sector, the marketplace, and in baseball, people love it, because they feel like that often they might have a bunch of cloudiness around uh, what people are really thinking. You're very direct in terms of bringing what is. And I admire that. I look at that and I aspire to that. But I'm curious, how does that translate in your marriage and with your kids? Well, first, let me just say this. And from the baseball world, that's, it, it, that gets you in trouble a little bit. I mean, John Scherholz, when he set me down before we, we came here, he said, look, one of the things that you're going to have to do a better job of, you've got to learn to tell the truth a different way. You've got you to be able to, you, you can't be so honest with, with things that are going on with, with the team. And, and, I've, and I understand where, where they're going with that. But I've always felt, you know what, if you have to, it's better to disadvantage yourself in negotiations or in relationships, be vulnerable, as, as you mentioned, uh, if you want to truly be understood and, and, and respect it in a way that moves the needle forward in the relationship. I think it's so important. And, and so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be right. I don't need to be right. I just want us to be right. Yeah. I just want us to thrive. Yeah. And so whatever I can do uh, in the leadership position as a general manager, as a husband, as a father, just to make sure at the end of the day, uh, we're all thriving. We're all moving forward. Yes. And I, I've found that the, the people that are in the leadership positions, they have to be the ones most vulnerable. They have to be the ones most transparent. Again, I think the only thing I can truly offer is my mistakes yeah. and, and what I've learned from those mistakes. And that's like when, when one of our players, uh, uh, whether they, they make a mistake and, you know, when Danny Duffy yeah. very publicly yep. DUI, I've said in that press conference, that could have been me. Yeah. As a young 20-year-old uh, in college getting behind the wheel, when we talk about pornography to our group and we talk about the harmful effects of pornography, well, I know in my 20s when I saw pornography, I know that the distorted view it gave me of yeah. what uh, an intimate relationship yes. ought to be about. I know the harmful effects of it. And so we, we don't, again, we don't look at anybody in a judgmental way. So look, I've been there. I've made those mistakes. But, but Jesus covered those. He took those to the cross. And so I don't have to be wounded. I can be transparent. I, I would rather be persecuted for who I am than praised for somebody I'm not. And I'm not going to, to, to go through life as a father and as a husband and as a member of this community as somebody that feels like that I've got it figured out because, Patrick, I don't have it all figured out. And like I said, most days I feel like I am failing. Yeah. And, and I need Jesus. Yes. I need to continue to pursue him yes. daily. And I need people around me that are going to pray for me and encourage me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's switch gears just for a second on parenting. What can your kids do? So your dad, mm -hmm. what can your kids do to make you feel special, valued, alive? What, what can they bring that you're like, man, that, that makes me feel loved? Well, I, I like to hear I love you. I like to hear that I'm proud of you, Dad. Wow. Um, uh, we, we came back from Arizona uh, this year to speak at a, a banquet, uh, an athletic banquet where my son goes to high school. And my son actually introduced me. And I, I, wasn't, 
I, w I didn't know he was going to do that. Um, I had gotten somewhat wind that he might, but I was like, yeah, it's not going to be a real, that's ah, going to be awkward. But, you know, when he, when he said that my dad is my hero, I mean, that, that oh stopped me. I mean, that brought tears to my eyes. And, uh, and so that was special. But, uh, you know, I, I love all of our, our children are, as I said, they all belong to God. And when I look at them in that perspective, I want to do good for them. I yeah. want to do better for them. Yeah. And so, but I've, where I've made my mistakes, honestly, is, is I've tried at times to keep them from some of the struggles. Yeah. Right. You, you know where some of the potholes are and you've, you've, you've done what you can to kind of pave their way a little bit. Uh, I've made probably my biggest mistakes when I've tried to make it really, really good for them and not let them experience some of the struggles. Right. Now, and, and so what we've learned is uh, as we move on with this next phase of parenting and because it's it hasn't changed for us. I mean, it's I mean, the, the, the kids are different phases of their lives. But what we're trying to do is let them fail a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Let them let them make decisions. Give them the pros and cons. Let them make the decisions. Don't don't go down that trail where I told you so. It's like our, our son's trying to make an interesting decision with what he wants to do in whether uh, play baseball or go to college or. And I, I've told him, I said, look, here's here's the pros and the cons. Yeah. Whatever you decide, I'm going to support you. This is your life. Your dreams are your dreams. Yes. They're not my dreams. Yes. And so, uh, and I'm going to support you. And I promise you, I'm going to make an, I'm going to make this commitment to you right now, son. Whatever you decide to do, whether it works out or it doesn't, I'm not going to second guess you. I'm not going to say I told you so. And I, so we've had this conversation already. So good. So good. Um, I'm just going to support him. Yeah. yeah. When he said that uh, that my dad's my hero. Mm -hmm. I know the context, the framework of that for you isn't that you want a World Series. Yeah, it, that's just kind of that's just a part of a bigger picture. For you, it's that he knows me at home. Yeah. He knows the real that's me. Right. He's seen it all. That's right. And I still emerge as his hero. Um, and I'm sure priority for you would be that he sees that I, I'm flawed but i pursue jesus with all my heart i want him to see that most i want him to see that i love my wife his mom i want him to see that i love him and his sisters i, I want him to see the man of character and as flawed as i am for me to emerge that way has to uh ha has to, i could see why you would cry mm -hmm. i would mm -hmm. i mean that's that's the gift mm -hmm. that we all dream of i think uh back to around 2007 I was sitting in my living room watching TV, and there was a local church mm -hmm. that was on, and you were being interviewed mm -hmm. at the church that you were attending. In the interview, uh, the pastor, which is where you were attending at the time, the pastor asked you, said, you come to church on Sunday morning on game day. You come to church early service, and, uh, and yet it's game day. Mm -hmm. how, how come you do that? And your answer was something that moved me. It, it just... it. It caused me to understand you in a different way than what I had understood you before. Mm. And what you said was, there are some things more important than baseball. Mm -hmm. My kids need to be sitting with their dad in church on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? You know, the, <clears throat> what I've always understood about, about leadership is the leaders are the ones shaping your culture. Mm -hmm. And, and wh whatever the passions of the parents are is going to be the priorities of your children. Yeah. And so uh, we, we have to set that example of what, what you want your children, how you want them to live their lives, how you want your grandchildren to live their lives, your future generations. We have to set the example. And in, and there's a lot of days uh, to be gut level honest with you. I'm like, I don't really feel like going to church today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really, I, I don't That's want, real. I don't want to go through it. The team's not doing well. Three, the first three or four people are going to ask me about what happened last night right. um, with the team. And, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and I love talking about, sure, 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 about sure. the team, but, uh, but the motivation at the end of the day is setting that example. Um, hopefully it becomes a priority for your children. And, but more than that, your children's children. And yeah. um, and wow. so, you know, that's wow. that, that's always been our heart for that. And, and again, my my wife loves going to church. Um, she loves being around people.
but she just really grew in her faith and yeah. she's just really blossomed. So it's been natural for us to, to attend church together. And it's partly a byproduct of your relationship with your own dad, because yeah. your dad required you uh, to go to church. He led that. He made he that a priority. He and did. then somehow, even though he probably felt like you do at times and I do, where it's like, am I being enough? Am I leading strong right. enough? He probably wondered that, but look what look what it produced in you and now in your kids. And the fact you get to pray with your kids yeah. says that there's a normative, there's something normal about spiritual life and measuring everything against God's word right. and his heart uh, that now then is, is very much a part of, of who they are. Um, when you think of uh, the years that were called the dark years, mm -hmm. 2006, all the way, you know, for really there were four years that apparently were more difficult than others. Sure. You've got little kids at the time. Yeah. You know, I think uh, if I have it right, Ashley's 11 and then three years staggered from there. Right, sure. And they're probably have some exposure to news. I mean, you can't protect your kids from what right. people are saying. You've got people who have uh, some gracious uh, attitudes and they're just given facts. But then you have people who are on radio and they're raging. Right. Parents of their peers are hearing the raging. <laughs> we had a lot of those fun conversations. Hey, I would love to, do you mind opening just yeah. a little bit of that? What yeah. was that like? Those were great, really. Looking back on it, and, and I knew at the time that we were going to experience some of that. And, and so we, we, Marianne and I, would, we'd pray about it um, to you know, protect our children. Um, God, what do you want them to hear? What you don't want them to hear? Um, don't let it affect them. Uh, don't let it harden them. We want them to love people. Uh, we want them to believe in people, uh, knowing that um, obviously their faith is in Jesus, but we want them to have strong, healthy relationships and trusting relationships, right? And so we, we would talk about it. And, and the, the, even though it hurt me, we would always take uh, the following stance. Look, it, it's okay. It's just sports. It's just a game. People mean well. They're not trying to be overly critical. Uh, they care about the team. Um, just be glad they care about the team. It's okay. We're, I'm a big boy. Uh, we can handle it. We knew what we were going to experience before we signed on to be a part of, of working in baseball and to come here to Kansas City. We knew this was going to be a great challenge. Uh, our oldest, Ashley, became a great prayer warrior throughout the, the, the entire time. And, and she would constantly say, Dad, I'm praying for you today. And, and uh, you know, our kids uh, obviously followed the, the team. And, and we had a, a, a funny story uh, when Robert, we first came here and Robert was four maybe the the following maybe he was yeah he was four at the time um and he was we I brought him into the game on a weekend and we were sitting in the clubhouse and buddy bell was a manager and and robert always called him buddy bell right he'd say hey buddy bell hey buddy bell <laughs> and so he said hey buddy bell do you ever get tired of losing and I'm sitting there on the couch in the in, in Buddy's office, and I'm going, "Oh my goodness!" Because Buddy, Buddy was really intense. I never, I didn't know how Buddy was going to respond to that, but Buddy handled it like a champ. And and so, but we knew it was important to discuss, uh, you know, those important times because they're great learning moments. And yes. and uh, people, I don't think people necessarily, um, you know wish poor things or, or, or what have you, you just got to let it go again. Yeah. It, it, you know what? So much of this goes back to the forgiveness piece. Yeah, right. It really does right. with, with everything that we're doing, the critical eye and the critical spirit part of, of how you have to, you know, look at things in life. And, and so we don't, we don't take it personal. Which I love how you parented that because today a lot of parents assume that you just let your kid figure it out. Mm -hmm. And what you were doing is saying, no, we're not going to let them just figure it out. We're going to guide them. We're going to lead them. Right. We're not just going to lead them with phrases or different teaching ideas. We're going to lead them with heart and attitude. So when they would pick up the energy off of you of forgiveness, right. of positivity towards the people, believing the best in situations, that molded their neuro, neuro, neuro pathways. Their brains actually began to mold. Oh, when, when my brain sees this, it's not right. some urgent 
predatorial action. This is just something that I look ahead and say, uh, it's all going to be good. Exactly. And forgive them. Let it go. Exactly. I love, love, love how you handled that. Let's go back to your dad mm -hmm. and talk about him a little bit. So you've talked some about your relationship with your dad, but let's dig further into that. What was your relationship with your dad actually like? Well, my, my father, um, as I said, he worked a lot. Uh, he was gone a lot. He traveled a lot. His job required him to do so. Um, but he, he always told us he loved us. He always told us he was proud of us. Uh, that I can still I can still feel his embrace and his hand. And he was a he was an affectionate person. He would hug us, uh, and he would tell us that he was proud of us. Uh, I remember one of the one of the more memorable times we had is he was going on a, a business trip, and he was going to be gone for a month. He was going to be in Belfast, Ireland, right? And and it was. Uh, it was my junior year of high school and, and he was leaving early in the morning and, and I got up early so I could say goodbye to him. And, and uh, we had a long embrace and he told me, you know, how much, you know, he loved me and how proud he was of me. And he knew he was going to miss, you know, part of my baseball season at the time. And, and so that was that was very memorable. I mean, some of the some of the wounds that I had, truthfully, though, uh, was his travel and him being gone. And there were uh, many occasions. Uh, during holidays, uh, I remember sitting down one Easter Sunday and uh, he got a phone call and he had to he had to go work on an airplane. And I, I remember the, the you know, my my mother getting upset. I remember the, the hurt uh, of our family because it was a constant theme during that period of time. Honestly, he he couldn't control it based on where he had his his job was in demand. He had to go. Yeah. Uh, and I saw so and I've always looked at doctors and nurses and, and and people in the medical profession kind of the same way. What you do. I mean, you get a phone call, you got to go. And um, um, so I've, I've always had kind of some I've had empathy for for people in those situations. But those are some of the things that that was particularly stressful. My mother probably didn't handle it as, as well as maybe she could have. I yeah. mean, she, she resented it a lot, yeah. uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it was, it was what he had to do. One time your dad, uh, you were playing ball, I think in college, and you're, you're complaining to your dad, mm -hmm. telling him how frustrated you are with your coach. And uh, I think you're calling him crazy and nuts and yeah. stuff like that. And, uh, and your dad gives this great line to you and says, well, son, maybe it's because he cares about you right. and turned it into a positive. Right. What were those kind of statements? Or maybe even like the statement where when you have missed an opportunity, there was an opportunity that came up that you were overshot by and they didn't hire you. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, they're probably going to call you on the yeah. way to the airport. Right. And you said that the belief he had in you the, right. the positivity he injected into you in that conversation meant so much. What were those conversations like? Yeah, you know, I remember the, the, the issue with uh, uh, my college coach, and he was tough, right? He was real tough and it's really very typical of, of coaches back in, in that era. And uh, I remember calling home and telling my father that I'm going to transfer. This isn't going to work. You know, there's no way I'm going to play for this guy. And he said, no, you're going to stay right where you are. He said, there's always going to be somebody your whole life telling you you're probably not good enough that doesn't believe in you. You're going to stick it out and you're going to persevere through it. And at the end of the year, we'll sit down and we'll discuss it if you still feel the same way. Well, that that support, that advice helped me persevere and end up being one of the best experiences of my life. Uh, coach Slobko, who was a coach at Garden City at the time, still remains uh, somebody that I, I, I talked to and really? actually took my son to, to meet this past December. Um, you know, and then and I remember those encouragement times, too. When I was I got released uh, by an independent team, the Erie Sailors out of Florida. Uh, um, and I called home, told my parents that my career, my baseball career was over. I'm going to transfer into coaching. And my father got on the phone and I explained it to him. And, and he, that's a true story. He said, son, I'm sure they made a mistake and you'll probably get a call before you get to the airport that you're back on the team. And I remember thinking during that period of time, I mean, that's that's pretty cool. This guy's continuing to encourage me and believe in me. And I knew it was it was over. But he he wanted to keep that positivity alive. Which, speaking of dads and their impact in our lives, yeah. for, for a dad to believe in us, 
And just to give an encouraging word, we're so busy today. There's so few times that we have to even interact, but just to get a text, just to get uh, a word of right. belief and energy that I care about you and I believe in you. Right. That goes a million. You know, miles. one of the things that I've learned, and it's just, I've just really understood it over the last four or five years. But words written and spoken uh, should be to encourage. Yeah. And encouraging words is what motivates people more than anything else. Wow. Just be an encourager. Believe that's it. That's a lesson. And um, that's, that's been powerful. But, you know, my father was a very positive, optimistic person. Uh, I know that came from the Holy Spirit yeah. because of what he went through in his childhood. And so I'm just really thankful for that. Well, let's uh, let's talk about your your spiritual life, and you have a growing relationship with Christ. Just kind of tell us how all that catalyzed. How did that begin? Well, you know what I my, my father was the, the spiritual leader of our family, um, so I, I knew the importance of a relationship with Christ. Um, but I, I'm not sure. I, I wasn't really committed in, until I was about 19 years old, away to college for the first time. Um, making choices uh, on my own, having that freedom. And, yep. and I realized that, you know, I wasn't making good choices. And, and uh, a teammate of mine invited me to uh, a Bible study. I knew it was the right thing to do. I knew that's where I needed to be. So thankful that God was continuing to pursue me uh, during that period of time. Uh, but I was probably walking away from my faith those early years of college and uh, but I, I went to the Bible study. I, I recommitted my life to Christ during that period of time. Um, my life didn't change overnight. I mean, I still dealt with a lot of the same temptations and a lot of the same issues. But I knew that the importance of, as you said, and continue to, to always pursue Christ and to pursue a relationship with Jesus. And, and that's what we've always tried to do. Patrick, I've, I've always wanted to be transparent, right? So one of the things I grew up, and even though my father was a spiritual leader of, my, of, our, of, our, of our family, my mother, my mother was just as much a hero to me as well. And my mother was very tough though. My mother was tough. Again, my father traveled all the time. Um, I've heard, I heard every cuss word in the book by the time I was 11 or 12, okay? I, they, were, they were a part. I mean, my mother, she would let it fly, right? And so that's something that I still struggle with today. Yeah. I still struggle with that. And, and be, because of scripture, and I'm, I'm in the book of James constantly about controlling my tongue. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going through Psalms right now, the, the, the book that Tim Keller and his wife yeah. had, had, uh, had, had made um, or had written. And uh, on May 5th, uh, the, the psalm was talking about uh, this particular uh, day about, you know, controlling your tongue and yes. speaking in kindness and, and uh, how your words impact. And so I'm in process with that constantly. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's one of my challenges. Uh, you know, I ask people to pray for me with that. Marianne knows to pray for me because I, I, I just want, I want to represent Christ right. But I know that, and I, oftentimes I've had to apologize to our staff, to people that I work with about uh, my attitude, uh, my language, um, things that I need to do better. Yeah. I know in one of the pastors groups we were in where you shared, uh, it was right after the World Series, and you shared during some of the more tense times here at Kaufman um, that you had done something you shared what it was. I won't share it to protect you, but uh, you shared something that you did. And I got to tell you, your transparency uh, is so attractive. It's mm -hmm. so, because we're all human. Mm -hmm. This is a human experience. We live in a fallen world. The second law of ther thermodynamics says that everything's fallen apart. Mm -hmm. So it takes incredible bravery and courage to face all of that. And even, you know, some of the uh, hyper reactions or the the trauma responses that you probably have that cuss words mm -hmm. wouldn't even want to come out for you to be real about that here and uh, to be honest it feeds our souls because mm -hmm. we all know it may not be cuss words for another person it may be something else right. but we all got our stuff that's right and so thank you thank you for even even going there one of the things you said this morning is that in your devotional time and so i just locked mm -hmm. in on that Tell us just a little bit. What, what's devotional time mean to you? What's that mean? Well, my my day begins uh, 
during the season. It begins. Uh, it still begins early. Not not as early as it does in the off season. But I always I always go to uh, my study and and spend time in prayer. Spend time reading, uh, trying to get my heart right, yeah. and and try to sync my heart and my mind together. So good. Um, you know, there, there's always. Um, you know, something that, that, that you're dealing with, of course. Uh, but I find when I don't do that, I mean, my day just begins to unravel much, much quicker. And so I have to take that time. Uh, uh, you know, my staff will tell you that uh, even during the season, even on game day, sometimes I'll get away for an hour, hour and a half. I'll go ride my bike, um, uh, maybe, you know, get away. Um, listen to uh, I'm, I'm fanatical about music i love christian music i love all types of music but uh you know i, I love christian music that that picks me up that's that feeds me uh you know anything that you put into your mind is how you're going to perceive life and how you're going to and ultimately what you're going to become yeah. and yeah. so I'm, I'm guarded against that i mean more so today than ever before i want to make sure i'm feeding my mind and my heart with with uplifting and positive things and 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 and, and not not shying away from from real issues it's not yes. what i'm saying but yes. when i have the, the, those positive influences and in, in the the word of god yeah. scripture uh, it helps me manage the day that's incredible I, I just love it i love who you are i know that you're a work in progress in your mind but for from a fellow human um i admire you yeah. i appreciate uh what you're fighting for. You may not feel like you've gotten the ground you want, but you're fighting for it. And that gives me courage to fight for it as well. Well, I appreciate what you do. My, my heroes have always been coaches and teachers and pastors and missionaries. I mean, it's, they've always been my, my heroes, so. Uh, that's amazing, thank you, thank you. Um, you have nonprofits. I just wanna make sure we close out with you sharing some of your passion uh, around the uh, Urban Youth Academy, the Underground Railroad, and then of course you have a great book. I want to encourage everybody to get more than a season. The book you wrote, mm -hmm. uh, I loved it. By the way, oh, thank you. Um, but share a little bit about your nonprofits. You know, what, one of the things that <clears throat> that we began to um, to pray about and to talk about um, after um, the 2015 season, knowing that what we were probably going to experience in 18, 19, 20, and 21, because we had made a decision that we weren't going to trade our players and we were going to add to our payroll with some long-term contracts that were going to be a little restrictive of what we could do going forward. And that's where we are right now. But we began to pray and seek counsel about, do I really have the, the energy and the toughness and the desire to go through this again? Right. Okay. And so one, one of the things that, that God put on our heart was, you know what, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to do a better job of serving others and, and, and doing wow. things in the community. And that is going to help sustain you and give you another outlet other than just be completely focused on what you have to do Amazing. with the team. And so the Urban Youth Academy has been a big part of that. Um, you know, the, the diversity is huge. I, you know, I don't buy into the lie that um, we're, we're in uh, harder times now than we were before. I think this is perhaps the, the greatest time of our lives where we have positive examples that can really stand out and really make a difference. Uh, are the challenges different? Yes, but we're still living in great times. And I think we need to just, we need to step up as leaders and leadership is needed today more than ever before. And we need to step up and say, you know what, I'm not going to judge. I'm going to do what I can to, to bring people together, different races, uh, different backgrounds, uh, different ec educational backgrounds, bring people together. And the Urban Youth Academy has been perfect for that, where we're trying to bridge the gap between the urban and the suburban and the rural parts of Kansas City, uh, break down barriers. Uh, you know, bring people together through the game of baseball and softball. And so where, uh, you know, that's the, the racial tension that exists today is it's, it's so much better than it was back, you know, in, in our parents days. OK, right. but we, we still have to continue to try to understand each other. And uh, so that that's been a, a passion of ours uh, going forward. And, and what I found is that kids today 
I mean, they want that. Yeah. They want that togetherness. They want that unity. And so we, we have to kind of separate whatever the, 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 the ills of our parents and our grandparents are. We, we've got to let that go and focus on the next generation. And so whatever, whatever bias that you have, whatever marinade you come from, um, or how you perceive race relations uh, in this country, you've got to let that go and focus on the next generation. So good. You know, the Underground Railroad, uh, slavery. It, 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 it's, it wasn't about black versus white. It was simply about good versus evil. It's yes. always existed in this country. And so that's our message. And that's what we're trying to portray. Yeah. And so for the next generation, so just, just to bring people together and to have that harmony, uh, you know, in, in this community. And so that, that's what we're working towards. Uh, you know, we know where that's ultimately going to come f- from. It's going to come from the hope and the faith and the love that Jesus uh, yes. is all about. Yes. Absolutely. And that's why I love the gospel so much. The gospels are always about, you know, putting others first. Leadership begins and ends with putting others first. Jesus came here to serve, not to be served. I mean, and that's why I've, I've always been fascinated and in love with the gospels. Oh my gosh, I just I love it. Absolutely so. love it. Well, Dayton, yep. this is thanks, been thanks, Pastor. Incredible. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you for so your time. Much. Thank yeah. you for what you're doing. And thank you. Appreciate yeah. you having us.